what is this series all about? The Conversationalist. It is about Jesus and how he is the best storyteller of all time. He is the GOAT of storytelling. And I absolutely love the stories that he tells. Most of them are, they're called parables. Simply, it just means an illustration. They are made up stories. They are not real. Jesus made up some fake stories uh, that were based off of some things loosely in their culture and their time that would have been understood really well by the listeners. And they had a moral and a spiritual point that the, the listeners were supposed to understand. But it's weird because the way he told them is he concealed the truth uh, so that only if you had a heart to receive what Jesus was saying, would you understand. And if you had a heart that is opposed to God, you would not understand. That's why he would always say, let him who has ears hear. And he told the disciples straight up, not everybody is going to understand the point of these stories. They're not going to. But I've revealed it to you and you understand because you know me and you know my heart and you know the heart of the Father. That's why you understand the meaning behind all of these stories. So it's really interesting. I've been coming up with some of my own stories, uh, modern day parables, if you will, and we'll get into another one of those today as well. But today, the title of the message, if you are taking notes, is The Mission. The Mission. Somebody say The Mission. And it's all about the parable of the lost sheep. Let's go ahead and jump right into Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you got it on your phone, you can get that as well. It'll be on the screen with you too. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. I love how that starts. The tax collectors and all you sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus. They're just very straight up in the Bible, all right? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Come on, let's pray as we get into God's word. Father, I pray that you would just open our ears, open our hearts, and that we would be a people that have ears to hear. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm jumping right into this today. We see in this parable, and you probably have heard this one before if you've been in church in any period of time. It's a very popular parable. Jesus told many, many parables. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, most of them are recorded in multiple different gospels. We have the gospels, which is the good news, the story of Jesus. You know it. It's the beginning of your New Testament. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these men, they wrote basically everything that they heard Jesus say. And so it's, it's recorded in multiple ones. But this is one of the most popular stories that Jesus tells. And I think the reason it is the most popular is because it reveals a truth about heaven and about Jesus' priorities that is very, very important for us to all understand. It reveals a little bit about who he is. And I've, in fact, I feel like it reveals everything about who Jesus is. And I would put it to you this way, it is that heaven's top priority is lost people being found. Heaven's top priority is people being found. If you're taking notes, write that down. You need to remember that everything in our lives goes back to this. There's many uh, companies they use uh, project management tools. I don't know if you use a project management tool. I certainly do. I used to use, there's one called Trello. Uh, there's other called Asana. Maybe your company uses it. Maybe you use it for personal project management. I know I could have used that in high school and college. I wish I had that technology back then because I was all over the place, y'all. I could not remember anything. I couldn't get tasks done. And it breaks down tasks in certain ways. And uh, Monday.com is another popular one. But um, it, it helps to break down large projects into smaller bite-sized tasks. Tasks, right? That's all it is. So you have a project title at the top, whatever it might be. Uh, and then underneath you have tasks. And then even on a more granular level, you can have a subtask underneath the tasks. Now, all of my organized people said, amen, hallelujah. That sounds great. All right. Me, the unorganized people are like, I have to use that or I never get anything done. <laughs> I just stare at my computer and like, what do I have to do today? 
Dah, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. If it's not on a list, if it's not subdivided like that, I cannot organize myself. So I use it all the time. But your company might use it for a product launch, for a big event, uh, whatever it is that is relevant to you. But if we were to get behind the scenes of heaven's operations team, right? Those of you operations people out there. If we were to get behind the scenes and, and hang out with some of the angels that are up there, just making stuff happen, right? Like they're on their, on their like, you know, lightning fast, ultra fiber means nothing to them. They're like a million times faster processing power up there in heaven. They're like, MacBooks, please, come on now. Like we got heaven books up here. And they're like typing and writing and everything. They're getting stuff uh, all organized for, for the father and for the, the army of God that's doing stuff here on earth. If we were to go behind the scenes and check out the top priority, what the title of the project is at the very, very top, not the subtask, not the task, but the very top, I believe the top of their list would simply say, seek and save. Seek and save the lost. And what is the win here? That's the thing that a lot of companies will ask. You get into a meeting, you go into the operations team, they say, hey, what's the win? What's the win? If this one thing happens with this event or with this project launch or product to launch, whatever it might be, what is the win? And there's a lot of great wins that we could have in our Christian life. There's really good ones. Not all of them are as important, though. You might have uh, John who memorized a new Bible verse and, and all of heaven goes, hey, that's great. That's awesome. Click that little subtask. Poof, it's gone. Awesome, John, good job. The Mitchells, man, they had a breakthrough in their marriage they, they, they went to uh, Trevor and Lindsay's marriage group, and it was amazing. And now they're breaking through. They're, they're hanging out with uh, other married people, and they're learning more about God-centered marriages and all that, and they had a breakthrough. Hey, that's great. Check that off. That's awesome. Maybe the church had a powerful service, and they're worshiping Jesus. Come on. All the angels in heaven are like, hey, that's good stuff. We like to see that. But Sarah, oh, Sarah, she gave her life to Jesus today. Come on, all of heaven. You know what it says in the Bible that all of heaven rejoices and you got to imagine them angels are like, come on. Yes, this is why we do what we do. When a lost person is found, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. This is what Jesus says. Are you not going to rejoice for that one, for the one person that comes into the family of God, the one person that strayed away from God and yet comes back into the family of God. All of heaven rejoices when somebody gives their lives to Jesus. That's why anytime somebody says yes to Jesus at the end of a service here at Radical Church, what do I always say? Come on, let's give God praise and let's rejoice. Let's get loud and let's get excited. Why? Because we're supporting those people in their new walk with Jesus. This is brand new for them. But also we're shouting and cheering along literally with heaven and the angels as we do that. Amen. Come on, it's a beautiful thing that we get to be a part of, helping people see and find Jesus for the very first time. Man, it's a beautiful thing. That is the ultimate win. It is the primary goal of heaven. So at Radical Church, it's one of our top priorities. That's what we care about around here is we want to see lost people found. And when somebody far from God gives our life to him, all of heaven rejoices, so we will too. Now, that's not to say that we don't have other priorities or other subtasks or tasks or things that as the body of Christ and also specifically as Radical Church that we care about. Of course, there's other great things and, and I've preached this message before and I might preach it again later, but there's this tension, I believe, in, in the church world that you can only be one or the other. You can only be a church that, that reaches the lost or you're only a church that is heavy on discipleship, right? We're, gonna, we're a reaching church. We care about Jesus' top priority, so we are doing everything we can to reach Jesus. Come on, they're the ones, we're playing U2 in service, right? You know what I'm saying? Like we're playing Taylor Swift. Uh, we're, we're, we're reaching the lost. Like we're doing those kinds of things. And the other church is like, please, <laughs> listen here, all right? We actually read the Bible around here, okay? We have accountability, and uh, we love Jesus more than those crazy people. All they're trying to do is reach people, but we're equipping the saints, come on, for the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these people over here are like, you guys are annoying. It, what in the world are y'all talking about? And like, it feels like you can only be one or the other. That you can equip the saints or you can reach the lost. 
And God gave me this word. I, people always say this. I don't have a problem with people saying this. They say, hey, we want to have a balance of both of these things. Like, we want to reach the lost and evangelize and tell people about Jesus, but we also want to equip the saints and have accountability and, and Bible studies, these things and things. Listen, it is not a either or, y'all. It is a both and, all right? The Great Commission did not just say, go and reach the lost. And that's it. No. It said, go, make disciples of all nations. And then what does it say? baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then what? Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. It's a both and situation. People always say we want to have a good balance. And I believe that Jesus says, hey, we want to have a fullness of both of these things, 100% of reaching, 100% of teaching, y'all. And that's what we care about at Radical Church. And that's what I want you to care about in your life as well. Because listen, I love worshiping God, Right? I do love reading my Bible. I love the teaching and, and the equipping and all that stuff. I love the body of Christ getting into the church and learning together and growing together. I love that. It's a beautiful thing. But over time, we'll have different priorities. Like we're going to have different seasons as a church. Right now, we're in a building season. We're doing a building project right now. There's going to be other priorities that will come up. We might be doing small groups. We have rad groups going on right now. But there's seasons that we don't do rad groups. We, we take a season off to let everybody chill out for a minute and be like, hey, I ain't trying to go to somebody's house every Thursday because that kind of gets a lot sometimes. I got to go on vacation, somebody. You know, we have seasons and priorities in our personal lives as well. And our vision for this year might be different than the vision for next year. We have a vision Sunday and we have uh, this time where we gather together and we do the miracle offering in December, early December. We take up an offering for all of our missionaries and all of the, the things that we support locally, regionally, globally, all around the world, our missionaries and different missions projects. So our vision might change from year to year, but listen, the mission will always stay the same. The top priority is always the same. And it is simply this, our mission is to help people experience the radical love of Jesus. Come on, somebody say, amen. We want people to experience God's radical love because we believe that God does have a radical love for each and every one of us. Now, we do all kinds of things. We got a fall festival. Come on, how many of y'all were at our fall festival in the last couple of years? It's been a lot of fun. I have a great fall festival. We had you know, 700, 800 people there. It was a ton of fun. It was crazy, y'all. We have kids' experiences every Sunday. We have events, we have groups, all kinds of different things. But are they leading people to find and follow Jesus and experience his radical love? If not, cut them. I don't even care. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If our services are not marked by the power and presence of God and people aren't finding Jesus on a regular basis, if this is just a country club for all of us to get together and say, how are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Great, awesome. And yet we're not reaching people for Jesus, then cut it, shut it down. I'd rather not do it. That's great. I love, the, I love this side of things. But man, listen, the top priority of Jesus, he says it over and over and over and over again, is it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. I came to seek and save the lost. It cannot get any more clear than that. And if we want to be like Jesus, man, then I think we need to also have the same heart as Jesus that we also want to seek and save the lost. Everything else that happens in our lives is simply a task or a subtask of the ultimate goal happening. Your trips to the grocery store, right? Subtask. Your kid's soccer game, subtask, all right? Maybe a task, that's a little bit higher because that can be crazy sometimes. Your school, your work, your family time, all of it comes back to the mission. That verse, it is in Luke 19, 10, if you want it, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Our goal is not just to enjoy church in these four walls, right? It's not to keep our faith to ourselves for our entire lives. But we are on a mission, y'all, to help people find and follow Jesus, to invite them into a thriving relationship with Jesus. But listen, okay, I get it, all right? For all of y'all that's like, hey, okay, we're on mission and everything, like, cool. But let me just level with you for a second. I get it. It's easy to think about ourselves. I just said it a little bit ago. We are our own top priority. Be honest with yourself. We are all our own top priority. You might think that you are giving to other people. You might be a very giving person, right? But at the end of the day, ultimately, we care about ourselves 
We care about our family and we care about our friends. Like I'm gonna take care of me, myself and mine, all right? And I get that. It's a very natural thing for us to think about ourselves. That is just our human nature. But when we had Tegan, our, our daughter, we have a son, Oakland, he's, he's four and almost five. And then we have Tegan, she's almost one. On April 21st, she'll be one. And uh, when we had Tegan, it was a little bit of a transition for Oakland, right? Those of you that have multiple kids, you know, especially if there's one that's significantly older, uh, you know, Oakland was three, three and a half years, you know, apart from Tegan. It was tough because up until then, all he knew was hanging out with Dada and Mama, hanging out with Mommy and Daddy, hanging out with Mom and Dad. He'd gone through all of those phases by the time we had Tegan, right? And so he gets to this point of, of having this new baby and he's so stoked, he's so excited, right? Uh, but then he wants to spend time with us and he realizes that, oh man, Tegan, uh, mom and dad, they have to be with Tegan all the time. She needs a lot. She needs a lot of attention. She needs a lot of love. She, she needs a lot of diaper changes, a lot of diaper changes, a lot of diaper changes. Good Lord, a lot of diaper changes, right? We're getting through this. And he got pretty upset at one point. He sat on the stairs. And he was whining and crying, and he said, and this was so sad, he said, guys, you'll never play with me anymore. <laughs> it, was, it just broke my heart as a dad, right? You know, like, you never play with me anymore. And that's all he knew. That's all he, that's all he knew. And it was really sad. We had to explain to him that, hey, buddy, we love you just as much as we have. And we'll make more time. We'll try to find some mommy Oakland time, some daddy Oakland time. But Tegan needs us more right now. She needs us in this season. And you're going to have to learn to play by yourself right now. You're going to have to go upstairs and play make-believe, all right? Ain't giving you that iPad. We started giving him this thing, and good Lord, all he wants to do is play Angry Birds every single day now. He's like, Dad, can you play Angry Birds with me? I'm like, buddy, just go play by yourself. You don't need an iPad. Get outside and go kick a ball around or something like we did when we were kids, okay? Come on. That's a whole nother sermon anyway. But you know what I'm talking about. You got to learn to play by yourself. Keep yourself entertained for a little bit. It is not that hard. Use your imagination. Uh, and then many of you that grew up with many siblings, I was just talking to somebody this morning who has uh, multiple siblings. I actually know his younger brother, and uh, they're a few years apart. Many of you, uh, I know Courage, they have 10, uh, there's 10 of them, uh, boys and girls in their family. And he's kind of somewhere in the middle there. And you know what happens if you have a lot of kids in your family? What happens? The oldest, what do you end up doing? Taking care of everybody else. And all of the older children said, <clears throat> You know what I mean. You drove them everywhere. When you were younger, you just took care of them. You maybe got a snack for them. Uh, you, you, you know, took them around or whatever. You played outside with them and watched them. You babysat while mom and dad went out on the town, okay? Uh, and then you get a little bit older and, you know, you're babysitting. Now you're driving them around places. You're, you're the one taking them to the soccer games and the soccer practices and all that stuff. And you have school and you have your friends and your life is so hard. Oh, my gosh. You're in high school. It's so difficult. I know all the high school people are like, yes, I know. Just wait. It gets worse. All right? So... I can't wait to get to college. It's not better, y'all, I promise. <laughs> but the oldest end up taking care of the youngest. That's just what kind of happens. And there's these levels of people that you have in, in, in life. And there's this, this baby. I'm going to talk about four people. The baby is the one that needs to be fully taken care of. 100% all the time, watched at all times, will fall down the stairs if there's not a gate there, those kinds of things. The toddler. And that's, or that was Tegan. And then the toddler, we have Oakland, my son, who, you know, hey, man, you got to learn how to play by yourself. You got to learn to start taking a little bit of ownership over your own life, okay? And, and, and a few things, yes, of course, we're going to hang out with you. Yes, of course, you still need us. But you got to start playing by yourself. There's things like that that you got to do. Then you have the teenagers. Oh, Lord, teenagers, who are they? They're the ones uh, that have to take care of the younger ones, right? And now they're complaining about that. I gotta take care of my younger siblings. Why do I gotta do that? I gotta take care of myself. Susie is over here going to the movies and I am at home watching my little brother and sister. Come on, that is ridiculous, mom. Get out of here. Anyway, but listen, you have these three different people and then you have the fourth, who is the adult, who takes care of all three of those people and themselves. Come on, adults, say, Amen in this place. Come on. You take care of yourself and wives. You take care of your husband, who's another child, and you take care of your three kids too. That's impressive. My wife said amen all the way from kids. She heard me right now. 
She's like, taking care of Trevor? Amen, yes. <laughs> the point is, is I want all of us to be careful that we are not one of the 99 complaining about having to take care of the one. I do not want us to be a church and a people that says, I don't care about the one, I care about me and my little sheep family over here. Oh, I don't care about the one that's gone out. I don't care about the one that's far away, that walked off, that wandered off. That was their problem. They're dumb for doing it. They're sinning. They're living a crazy life. I don't care about them. Listen, I got to take care of me and mine. And then there's nothing wrong with taking care of your family. There's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself and your own relationship with God. But at the end of the day, there are people out there that need you. There's people out there that need you to step up and share your faith with them. There's people out there that don't know Christ. And we believe in a real heaven and a real hell. We don't like to talk about that in church, but listen, if we believe these are real places, we believe that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. If we believe that, then we gotta start telling some people, come on now, be careful that we're not one of the 99 that's complaining about Jesus going off to take care of the one or the church going off to take care of the one. But listen, we need to mature and grow up in our faith. Become a toddler and start learning how to take care of yourself a little bit. Start learning how to feed yourself and get to church and read your Bible and, and invest in yourself and your own walk with God. And, and when you're a teenager, right, and you're having to take care of the little ones, you're having to take care of all these baby Christians that are starting to show up at Radical Church. You're starting to take care of these baby Christians and, and people that have just said yes to Jesus. They need so much help. They ain't got no clue what's going on in their walk with Christ. Don't complain about that. It is an honor and a privilege to take care of somebody that is starting a relationship with God. It's a beautiful thing. And when you become mature and you're an adult, listen, now to what do we get to do? We get to take care of ourselves, our husbands, and all three of those other people, the baby Christians, the people that are growing in their walk with Christ, the people that are mature, but man, they just need somebody a couple steps ahead of them. Now we're helping all of these people. And we're also being mentored because how many of you know we all still have a mama and a dad dad? Come on now. We still got a mom and dad and we have other people and spiritual moms and spiritual dads that can help you and your faith even as an adult. My parents are sitting right here on the front row and I still go to them for advice all the time on things. And it's the same way as an adult in your walk with Christ. You got to find some people that are a few steps ahead, a few, uh, a few miles ahead of you that can lead you and guide you into what's next. The ultimate goal is we need to stay on mission, y'all. We are on a mission. And so the question I have for you this morning, it's a simple question. It is, am I actively inviting people into a relationship with Jesus? Am I actively inviting people to find and follow Jesus? Am I on this mission with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit to seek and to save the lost? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would say, some of us, yes. Some of us, absolutely. Hey, I'm, I'm sharing my faith on a regular basis, how I can and when I can. Obviously, you don't have to stand on a street corner every single day or every weekend and yell about Jesus. Like I get, you know, there's some tact to it as well, but are you active in that process? Are you active in the mission? Or are you sitting by passively and saying, hey, I'll let the church handle that. I'll let Pastor Trevor handle that. That's what pastors are for, right? That's what the church is for, is they help find, the. I just bring my friend to church, they get him saved, and then they also take care of him. Listen, God says that every single one of you are anointed and have the ability and every single tool that you need to be a part of the process of finding, of following Jesus and discipling one person. Who is your one? There's 99 people, uh, there's, there's, you know, 120, 130, 140 people in this room right now. All of you, if you found one person that you can invest in, one person in your life, a friend or a family member or somebody that does not know God, if every single one of you would invest in that one person, what could God do in our city? What could God do in your family? You think revival could start from that? Come on, absolutely. I believe it. So like I said, I have a parable for you today. I like writing. I'm a huge writer. I really enjoy speaking, but I think I might enjoy writing even more. And I wrote a little story, and I think it will illustrate this point fairly well. Let's say you find yourself one day in a doctor's office. He sits across from you and gives you the worst possible news. Stage four 
cancer. It's already spread throughout your whole body and there's nothing you can do. It's only a matter of time. You're devastated. Your family's devastated. You don't know what to do. A few months later, as the cancer is progressing, a stranger comes up to you, hands you two small vials and say, hey, take one of these and you'll be cured. Walks away. All right. You don't know what to do with it first, but in desperation, you don't have any other options. You say, you know, what could it hurt? I'm gonna die anyway, mine as well. You go in for scans a little bit later and miraculously, you are healed. Of your terminal, untreatable cancer, it's gone, right? Incredible news. The doctors are confused. They've never seen anything like this. It's never happened before. But you know what it was. You know, because you took one of those vials for yourself. It's this miracle medicine, the cure to cancer. Now, years later, your close friend shares the news with you that they have cancer now too. And they've only been given a year to live. That evening you get home and you open the drawer next to your bed where you've kept that other vial ever since that day when you got the news that you were cured. And you've never shared with anyone about what happened that day and now you have a choice to make. Do you give this vial to your friend? Help them beat that cancer the same way that you did or do you simply keep it in the drawer and hold on to it? Worship team, go ahead and come on up. We're gonna close here in a minute. Right now you're thinking, of course I'd give it to them. Absolutely I'm going to give it to them. Why would I ever keep that to myself? And yet that is exactly what we do with the news of Jesus. It's exactly what we do all the time. The cancer is sin. You are the person infected with cancer. The stranger that gives you the vials is the Holy Spirit tells you about the good news of Jesus. The vial of miracle medicine is the good news of Jesus. And the doctors are the world trying to solve life's problems with their worldly solutions. And your friend in the story is exactly that, your friend. Your friend that doesn't know Jesus yet. Your friend that is infected with this thing called sin. The one that doesn't have the hope in the life of Jesus yet. Don't hold on to the cure. That's my message today. If I could put it in one phrase, don't hold on to the cure. Because we're all infected with sin, right? We are all born into this broken and messed up world. And we might have a pretty good life here, honestly, but we know that this world is infected with sin from the very beginning, Adam and Eve, when they messed up. Sin entered the world and now all of us are born sinners. That's what the Bible says. But now Jesus has given us this hope of salvation through him and how sad it would be if we kept that to ourselves. How sad it would be if we held on to this hope and this abundant life that we have and we see somebody struggling or, or maybe they don't even realize that they're struggling yet. But we know. And yet we choose to hold on to this life and hold on to the, the cure. Let's share what God has done, amen? Let's proclaim the good news of Jesus because like Jesus said in Luke 5, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus starts his ministry even by reading Isaiah chapter 61. He says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Come on, this is what Jesus came for, to give liberty to the captives, to give healing to people that need healing, to give life to people that need life, to show all of us that we are sinners in need of a savior. And God has anointed you in the same way that God anointed his son Jesus to preach the good news to the world. And we get the privilege and the honor to partner with the Holy Spirit in sharing that with people around us. 
It's not a burden to share my faith. It's not weird for me to talk about going to church or reading my Bible. Man, sometimes I bring my Bible to the coffee shop and just sit it on the edge. I'm working on something else. I'm not even reading it, but I just put it there just in case somebody wants to talk to me about it. I bring my Radical Church cup and I put it right there. I face it toward the door. You walk in, you see my Radical Church cup. Somebody asked me about it. Why not? There's little things that we can do and, and little opportunities that God gives you. That one person that's far away and yet we're so consumed in the 99. We're so consumed with us and with the church, with our family. And I get it, listen, I get it, but can I just challenge us for a second? to think about somebody else, to think about the world, to think about those people that are dying and not knowing Jesus for a second, man. It's important. If we believe it, then it's so important that we share our faith. You can be a part of changing someone's eternal destiny. It says it right here, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are co-workers. Somebody say co-workers. You're a co-worker in God's service is what it says. We get to be co-laborers is another way they say it, co-laborers, co-workers, working alongside the Holy Spirit, working with God. I think that's a beautiful thing, that we get to change somebody's eternal destiny by speaking life over them, by speaking love over them, by serving them, by living for others, not just for us. And you have a role to play in the one coming home. We all do, I do, you do. I'm not any different than you. A lot of people think that the pastor is the only one that can help people find Jesus. Come on, man, get out of here. The disciples were a bunch of ragtag group of of misfits, tax collectors, sinners themselves, like people that were not even good enough to actually become students of other rabbis. And Jesus said, you, I wanna choose you. Fisherman, tax collector, sinner, hanging out in a tree. Like, come on down here, let's walk around. Let's have some fun. Let's, Let's get people saved. And yet we think that God can't use us. Now, after you get saved, you're in the army now. You're in the army. There's an old song about that, isn't there? Right? What is that? Somebody help me out. I can't remember it. Oh, man, I got to think about that. Yeah, I can't remember the song. Somebody from Children's Church in the 90s knows that, all right? So, but you're in the army now. You get to fight against hell. You get to take some ground from the kingdom of God. We get to seek and save the lost alongside of God. And let's make heaven more crowded together. Come on, is anybody excited that we get to share and we get the privilege to share our faith with other people and that we as a church and you as an individual are gonna help make heaven more crowded. Come on, I wanna see people saved, delivered, set free from addictions, from sin. I want their family to be restored, man. I want their kids to to, to find and follow Jesus. The Bible says that when they are old, they will not depart from it if we train those kids early. Come on, man. That's what I care about. And that's what I hope that you'll care about too. Listen, I know we come to church and we wanna hear a word from me. I'm like, God, speak to me. Speak to me and help me get through this week. But listen, I think God wanted to challenge me, challenge every single one of you today. Listen, you came to church today and this word is for you. Let me tell you. It is for you because Jesus is all about the lost and man, I'm gonna be too. Why don't you stand up with me? I just wanna pray over each and every one of you. And then I want us to sing this song again, can we? Come on, we're gonna pray for revival and we're gonna speak revival over our families, over our cities, over our jobs, over the people we work with. And I want you to think, who is the one Who is the one in my life that I can reach out to? That I can invite to Easter services? I don't know, like that I can serve on a Sunday morning. Who is that person? I want us to pray. And as we pray, we're gonna sing. And man, I want you to just lock in right now and say, God, whoever you want me to talk to, whoever you need me to reach out to, I'm available. I wanna be a part of the revival starting. Start a flame, start a spark inside of me, God. And there's a way that I want every single one of you to help. And that's I want every single person to think of who that person is and be bold. Invite somebody to church this Easter. It's the easiest thing that you can do. So invite somebody to church, man. 
I guarantee you we're going to take care of them well. We're going to have a message of hope, a message about Jesus. Come on, about salvation, that Jesus is alive, that he is not dead, and there is hope and life in him. And I guarantee you, in the spirit of God, I already believe it is moving within our church and moving within our midst. And we're going to be in that building, and God is going to do something absolutely incredible that we have never seen before. And I believe if you will invite that one person to come, man, God can impact their heart and change their life forever. And all it takes is a text. All it takes is an invite. All it takes is a spark within you to be bold, to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a part of the solution to this broken world. Come on. Hey, let's worship together. Let's sing together. Come on. Let's worship you Jesus. You can light it up. You can light it up. God, God give us a renewed passion for the mission today. Let Come on. Hope arise. Death Thank you, Jesus. Is overcome. Give us both this God. You we're going to preach your word. We're going to live it out, God. Of revival. Bring revival through me, God. Start it here, God. Night. Yes, Lord. You can light it up. You can light it up. God of revival. Let hope arise. Oh, God. Do it in the Sing, come awaken. It's our prayer. Come on, awaken our city, Lord. Come awaken your city. Thank you, Jesus. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every struggle will crumble. I feel the chains in the past. God of revival, pour. that it doesn't just start with others. God, I want it to start with me. If we would all have that same mentality, Father, how much of an impact could we make? I want to see the city of Kyle, Texas saved. The city of Buda, San Marcos, Wimberley, Dripping, New Braunfels, Austin, Texas, all around, God, the east side, the west side, north and south, God, let your word go forth. Help people to see that there's a better way. And in fact, there is only one way, and that's through your son, Jesus. God, give us the passion and the boldness to care about the things that you care about which is the loss, to seek and to save the top priority at the top of the list, God, is to seek and save the lost. You said it over and over and over again, Jesus, and we believe that's the Father's priority. God, your heart is to seek and save. You wish that none would perish, but that all would have eternal life. And you sent your son, Jesus, to die on a cross so that all of us might have life. In this place today, I just wanna give everybody the opportunity to say yes to this Jesus, the same Jesus that died on the cross for you and for me. You might, be, you might be that lost sheep right now, and you know it. 
All right, if you are, then you know. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling you right now, you know you're not living for God, right? And you wanna get right with God today. You wanna say yes to Jesus. I wanna give you that opportunity right here, right now. Don't wait any longer, say yes. Start living your life for God and see what he can do in you and through you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I just wanna give the opportunity. All I'm gonna ask is, I'm gonna count to three and I want you to raise your hand and just look up at me. Just make eye contact with me so I can see you. I wanna know who I'm praying for this morning. If that's you, you wanna say yes to Jesus and have that abundant life and get on mission to help people find and follow Jesus, your family, your friends, people around you that need hope, that are addicted, that are broken, man, they need you. One, two, three, is that you? Raise your hand, I see you, my man, I see you, I see you. Come on, I see you right here. I see you over here, right here. Come on, anyone else, look up at me, raise your hand, you can put it right down, I see you right there in the middle, yes, absolutely. Come on, anybody else? Let me see you, raise your hand and look right up at me, you can put it right back down. Anybody else today? Come on, I see you. Yes, sir. Come on, man. Yes. We're praising God in the back. Come on now. Yes. Anybody else today? Thank you, Jesus. I counted seven people today saying yes to Jesus. Come on, like we said, let's rejoice. Come on, let's give it up. Come on, man. You know you need to get right with God. You're doing it today. Today's the day. We're not going to wait any longer. And after that, we remember our mission now. You're a part of the family. We're going to help you. You might be a baby or a toddler right now. It's okay. We all, we're all on a journey. We're all growing in this thing together. Come on, let's pray. Say everybody together. Jesus, thank you for saving me, for healing me, for setting me free from the power of sin. I'm no longer a slave, but I am a son or daughter of the most high God. I give my life to you. I say yes to you right here, right now. Thank you, God, that you've taken all my sin and thrown it away, creating me a clean heart and a renewed mind. I give everything to you in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give a big hearty amen and give it up to Jesus this morning. Yes, sir. That's what we like to see. Like I said, that's what we care about here. All you people that have been in church for 40 years, come on, we care about you too, don't get me wrong. But let's not ever lose the mission. Let's not ever take ourselves more importantly, think of ourselves more importantly than we really are, man. We're all on mission to do this life together as one. And I'm gonna rejoice this afternoon. I'm gonna rejoice every single day. And on Easter Sunday, I believe we're gonna have dozens, uh, if many, many, many people say yes to Jesus on that day. What I wanna encourage you to do is if you're ready to get in the mission, you're ready to hop in, come to our Rad Team Rally, our Easter Rally. It's on April 1st, hop in. You don't know anything about serving, you don't know anything, where am I gonna go, I don't care, it doesn't matter. Just come, hang out with us, see how God can use you and your gifts to advance the kingdom of God, take some ground, fight against hell. Let's put our feet on his head and say, not today, Satan, but we're living for Jesus and we're taking the city of Kyle and Hayes County for Jesus. Amen. Come on. Hey, thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to pray a blessing of prayer over you. Father, bless them and keep them. Bless their children. Bless their families, their co-workers. Give them favor in every area. Uh, God, you are a provider. Provide for them. And as they are faithful to you, God, be faithful back to them, just as your word says that you will always be. You will never leave us and you will never forsake us. And God, we praise you and thank you. All God's people said, Amen. Hey, y'all have a great day. God bless you.